Good afternoon, everyone. I have 4 o'clock, and I think we'll go right ahead and get started. My name is Kathy Nickham. I'm the Education Director for the DTC Education Center. And I'm excited uh, to have you share with us the next hour where we talk about relieving pain through humor. Uh, we'll start with just a couple of housekeeping tools before we move forward. All of your lines are muted. Um, at the end of the program, we'll have time for question and answers. And you can unmute your phone by doing pound six. If you're unmuted, know that everyone will be able to um, hear you. So during the presentation, please keep yourself muted at star six. You can also ask questions through the chat box, um, make comments at any point throughout the presentation. And you will receive the link to the recording and slides as well as handouts by email. And we ask you to please complete the feedback form that will be available at the end of the program. Your input is very helpful to us as we plan new webinars and programs, as well as um, newsletter articles and things like that. So today, as we talk about this topic on relieving pain through humor, it's the perfect time because it's also National Humor Month. So it's a good time to think about humor, how we can use it and apply it in our lives. And today we have Mary Laskin, who's a registered nurse. She's also a certified laughter leader expert, as well as a certified humor professional. She's going to be sharing with us, as well as Steve Wilson, who's been um, on some of our calls in the past. Besides being a member of our DTC Education Center Advisory Council, he's also a psychologist, a humorist, a laughter therapist, the co-founder, director of the World Laughing Tour, um, has trained thousands and thousands of people to be laughter therapists. At this point, I am going to turn the program over to Steve, who's going to um, talk to, to Mary. They're going to sort of interact back and forth, but he's also going to share with us a little bit more about who she is and um, a little bit more about their connection. Steve, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful day. Welcome, everybody. We're so happy to be with you. I just want to double check. Mary, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I hear you fine. We're checking out the technology. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Mary is in California. Uh, it, the, and uh, Kathy, I, I think Kathy's in Indianapolis. Uh, it was just remarkable that we have the technology uh, available to us to be able to communicate and, and share information and uh, answer questions uh, on uh, any particular topic. Some people are uh, with us by phone, but not seeing the screen, but they will see it uh, if they get the recording and get the link, and they'll, they'll see it, the whole thing. Um, Mary, you are a nurse, and not just a certified laughter leader, that's a special designation that you earned starting with training uh, 12 years ago on the topic. Yeah. So you're steeped in the what is, what the therapeutic aspects of laughter, um, and you have achieved expert-level status, which is terrific. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, would you please explain to us what you've been doing out in California for a few years that has to do with pain and laughter. Of course. Um, I currently work as a nurse case manager in a chronic pain clinic. We're an outpatient clinic as part of Kaiser San Diego area. Um, and we're a multidisciplinary clinic. And uh, the foundation of our program is a six-week cognitive behavioral program that teaches patients living with chronic pain um, different skills to help them learn how to manage the pain on their own. And being a 
certified laughter leader, I came in and thought this is a great fit for us to add some therapeutic laughter to the program. And we started oops, about five years ago. And um, the feedback from the patients is, is really good. We uh, teach about the benefits of humor, and then we do some laughter exercises and talk about attitudes um, using good-hearted living, which we'll briefly talk about later today. And um, the feedback from the patients has, has been good. It's, this is another tool they can use to help with their pain. So we're, we're talking about something that didn't just fall off the turnip truck, so to speak. I mean, this, <laughs> this, is, this is not something that's stuck. You've been at this for years. Yes, yes. Um, so you have a lot of you have a lot of experience. Uh, your expertise on pain is very important um, because you've studied it and worked with it so much. Um, mine comes a lot from my own pain, um, so I'm comparing notes with the, you know the science and the theory uh, with my own personal experience and that of, of many other people. Um, so uh, I, I, this is very important. I, I immediately I want to ask you, Mary, that because we're using the term chronic pain, and that's who you are involved with in your your project. Uh, so, if what is chronic pain, and what and if it's not chronic, what kind of pain do we have? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, there's we usually classify pain as acute meaning it's um, an immediate response to an injury, so it's fairly recent. And acute pain serves a purpose. If you put your hand in a flame by accident, you, you know to pull it out because it's dangerous to keep it there. So if you were living without pain, um, you would end up with lots of injuries. But with chronic pain, it's pain that's usually defined as persisted longer than more three or more lo months longer than the expected recovery time. And so the tissues have healed, but pain is persistent. And what we're really finding with chronic pain is that the nervous system gets rewired in a way so that um, it almost becomes a disease in itself. That uh, So you need to learn how to try to reset your nervous system. And that's where learning some of these skills becomes so important when living with a condition like persistent pain. Uh, Mary, I heard a term recently, uh, are you familiar with this, intractable pain? Yes. You it's kind of the same is? thing. Have you heard yeah, that? it just means that you can't, you can't cure it, and that's pretty much what we're talking about with chronic pain, too. The, the patients that come to us often have been told that um, we can't cure your pain. So now what do they do? Because when you're living with chronic pain, it's going to affect so many parts of their life. Um, and um, it can um, affect everything. So how do we make their life better? And actually, this might Can be I a good chance. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to say, uh, almost always when I'm talking to a doctor or a nurse about my own pain, uh, they ask me to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, how, how, how painful is the pain? Um, is chronic pain always at the same level for everybody? No, it often, um, like any chronic condition, it has ups and downs. And so you're going to have some flares. Um, yeah, the slide that's on there now just talks about the impact of chronic pain, that um, mm -hmm. it's actually more than people with diabetes, heart disease, and cancer all added together are the total number of people living in chronic pain in the, in the U.S. Um, it's one in five ad adults. So we're talking about a pretty prevalent problem. Um, and then the next slide shows but again, that. It, oh, yeah. sorry. Go. 
again, I just want to uh, remind everybody that uh, we're, when we're talking about chronic pain, we're talking about how long this has been going on. And it might not be at a very intense level, or it might be, might be low, medium, or high. So, and it might flare. Um, but it goes on, kind of can't quite relieve that for a, a, a long period of time. Right, and, and we have to we tell our patients that we probably can never make the pain go away. We can't fix the pain, so it's how do we help them live with the pain where the pain is not controlling everything, like in this the slide that's being shown now, um, where the pain is in the driver's seat. We want to give them skills to let the person be back in the driver's seat. Um, of controlling their life. So teaching them this variety of skills can really make a difference in the quality of their life. They still may have pain, but it's not taking over everything. So patients, and I just I want to make this uh, uh, clear for the uh, audience and people who are listening to this. Uh, this this uh, webinar, what we're talking about today, we're, we're just sort of hitting the highlights. Uh, of information that people might be able to use to help uh, manage uh, or relieve pain. But what the patients who are involved in your uh, sessions to learn this uh, spend a lot of time. Um, it's several weeks. It's dozens of hours of learning and practicing. Yeah, so there's much more to it than, yeah. Right, we're hitting we're the highlights. We're kind of brushing right. the surface here. Yes, um, yeah, and it's okay. often skills they need to practice because it's like learning a musical instrument. It takes practice to learn some of these skills, um, but once they learn them and start practicing them and getting better, then they are really are in more control of their life. Okay, that's, that's terrific. That's very encouraging. Hopeful. Yeah. I'm going to let you take this and tell us what tell us what you want us to know next. Okay. Um, so just to explain a little bit about the physiology of pain because of chronic pain, because research shows if you understand that, that's a big part of one of these skills is the people who know about pain seem to have um, less pain. Um, the body contains over 400 nerves totaling 45 miles and these nerves are primed to act as an alarm system to protect the body these alarm signals come from threat or danger signals these are nerves called nociceptors in the tissues and so like we said earlier acute pain serves a purpose it tells you that there's danger so these nerves are primed to feel danger and it was initially thought that okay. Go ahead. I was just want to say pain pain is a signal. Hey, something is wrong. Pay attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And it it was initially thought that these signals only went one way. Um Descartes back in 1664 thought, you know, you've got those danger signals. You feel put your foot in the fire and it goes up through the spinal cord in the brain and you feel pain. But what we now know um, is that pain, there are pain signals, there are signals coming from the brain going down as well that influence whether there's pain. Because what we found is sometimes you can have pain and there's no tissue damage, or sometimes you can have tissue damage and no pain. And for those of you looking at the slides, um, I'm showing a picture of a boot with a, a nail through it. And this was a construction worker that fell on this this nail, um, landed on this nail that went through his boot and was in horrible pain. They took him to the emergency room. They had to give him large amounts of um, opiate pain medicine. Um, and then when they were finally able to get the boot off, they found the nail went between his toes. Um, but And there was no tissue damage at all. But the threat, the brain saw this picture of this giant nail going through his foot and thought he was in terrible danger. So the brain produced pain 
because they thought he was in danger. Um, the picture on the right is shows a nail going up into someone's skull. It was another construction worker, very dangerous work, um, where he was firing a nail gun. It misfired and he didn't realize it and went in for a toothache. And they did, took this picture and they found this nail lodged in his brain. And his brain just thought it was just a normal little toothache. He didn't really have um, the kind of pain you think you would have with this type of injury. So it shows that you can have tissue damage and no pain. So when you're working uh, with your patients uh, uh, with chronic pain, uh, you really uh, want them to understand about the how the mind uh, works into this whole uh, formula, the whole you know process. So you can imagine or or anticipate you think something is going to hurt, um, but uh, if you know, for instance, it occurs to me though if you know you're going to have a procedure that might be uncomfortable, perhaps there's some preparation you can do to understand how this all works. Um, I hope we'll be able to talk about that as we go along. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's really what the whole thing is, is whether your brain thinks you're in danger or not. So the new thinking, rather than this nerve pathways going up and down the brain, is that we have something called neurotags. And the brain maps pain because you take in these signals coming in. It's a mass of brain and neuroimmune networks and they collaborate and compete for influence um, and so like things are firing all over the brain and it might be it'll take a situation like that that nail through the boot the person saw it so that caused stimulated the part of the brain that processes sight they he heard all the people around him getting up worried and thinking he was in danger. And then he had memories of, oh no, what's gonna happen? I remember my so-and-so got this nail injury. So all these different parts of the body, the smells, whatever it means to you. Um, if, For example, if you're a violin player and you injure your finger and you depend on your fingers for your, um, your livelihood, that's gonna carry more meaning and the pain might be interpret as more danger. So it's going to all add up to more of a danger um, conclusion, and so your brain is going to mm -hmm. produce pain. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of some training that I had with the Red Cross and, and uh, first aid training and in emergency situations. And, and one of the uh, uh, pieces of advice that we got was uh, if we come upon on the scene of an accident and you're dealing with somebody who has an injury, uh, is uh, to say comforting things like you're going to be okay, regardless of what it looks like. Uh, we don't want to say to the person, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Um, and you need to say that to yourself. You need to be have, have calming um, words and phrases. You say, this is temporary. This is going to pass. Um, I'm going to be okay. I'm in good hands. Help is here. I mean, things like that. It's important so that we're trying to, you know, produce and create the, a positive expectation within ourselves. It, it I doing? makes a Am huge I... difference. Yes, that's exactly right. Because if, you know, as I said earlier, with chronic pain, you're going to have good days and bad days, ups and downs. And so many of my patients will have a flare and, and they start thinking, oh, this means I'm getting much worse. That means I'll never get better. No, it's just a flare. It's just one of the bad days. Things will pass. I, I know I have good days and bad days. I'm safe, sore, but safe. And um, this ah. is just due to my sensitive nerves. And use that kind of talk to yourself can make a big difference. Right. Great. I see on the screen, uh, Mary, that uh, Melissa, who's listening in, is asking how often uh, do do patients visit you for these laughter sessions or the educational sessions? Um, could you, could you yeah, say a little bit about that? Sure. It's part of uh, it's part of our our program. The the patients go through the whole six week program um, 
And the laughter program is just one piece of that program. So they might just see me once for that, but I do refer them to the community, to ongoing laughter groups. There's some uh, laughter yoga leaders in the community that run regular laughter groups. So if this is something they prefer to seek out on their own, they have those resources in the San Diego County. And, and we're saying that because we know now there's pretty good evidence of that laughter has its own physiology. If you're amused, if you are, um, if you find something humorous or funny uh, that, and you giggle or chuckle, it doesn't have to even be a big belly laugh. Uh, that that uh, there's a there's neuroscience that shows uh, how that affects uh, stress hormones, reduction of stress hormones. There's a whole physiology of laughter. It's good to know. Laughter is a uh, is a good thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> especially if you're really amused. Especially if you're really <laughs> on the side of something. And we're, you know, I'm encouraging people to practice and learn, and it's something you can learn because you're not born with it, but learn how to lighten up because if you don't lighten up, you're going to tighten up. If you lighten up, you might relax. If you tighten up, you might snap. Learn to lighten up. That's part of the process. Can't teach it all here in this hour, but we've done some before. We'll do more, and you do a lot of it. Yeah. I, and I really encourage my patients that you don't have to be funny, just see funny, look for funny things around them. There are funny things that happen all the time if if you just open your eyes and, and watch for them. Um, and then I encourage them to write down funny stories that happen to them. Uh, keep those cartoons that they find that, that, that make them chuckle because if you are feeling down or are having a hard time, it's it's hard to think of what to make you laugh, but then if you've got it in a place to access, you can go and 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 get that easier. Oh, I like that. I like kind of keep a, a a humor diary or catalog of the, the things that that you thought were amusing. Yeah, and I recommend that the people might want to create. A, we I call it a humor first aid kit. Yes, uh, I that's what I amazing. call it too. Yes. Oh, <laughs> okay. Like wind-up toys and, and cartoon books and things that you could access in a minute or so. Uh, Absolutely. Shift your perspective. Great. All right. Let's let's see where we where are we going. Where what do we have to oh, on this Okay. Slide? So uh, the next slide just kind of shows summarizes what I said about how the neuro tags decide whether you're in danger or not. For example, if you're crossing a crosswalk and twist your ankle, your brain is going to think that's dangerous but and hurt, your ankle will hurt. But if a bus is coming at you and you need to get out of the street to survive, you probably won't feel any pain in your ankle right then. You're going to, you know, the danger is more from the bus, not from your ankle. So it all really depends on how your brain is assessing danger or no danger. Um, so that's, if you start thinking about things like that, is it dangerous or not, then it's a way to um, help you understand what's going on with your pain. And that, so the opposite of that is to look for things, uh, messages of safety, and that will counteract those danger signals. Um, but what happens with chronic pain is that your systems become really edgy because they've been pra your nervous system has practiced this. Um, Lorimer Mosley and, and David Butler, who've written this wonderful book called Explain Pain, talk about that you have this orchestra in your brain that's learning the pain symphony. And when it plays it over and over again, it's going to get really good at it. And so your nerves become extra edgy and really good at playing the pain song. And it's kind of like turning the volume up to 11, like they talked about in the movie Spinal Tap, that you're just really sensitive. Mm -hmm. And um, that's often called centralized pain or a sensitive nervous system. Um, and so we want to, the best way to help calm this kind of nervous system down is to look at things that will counteract 
this this these danger signals and um go ahead what are some of those things yeah let's look at that yeah so you want to anything that's going to counter when you think about a sensitive nervous system it's your fight or flight nervous system firing the danger signals so anything signals anything that's calming the nervous system down will be part of your rest and relax nervous system like deep breathing and I think that's one reason laughing works good because you take a deep breath just as part of laughing you have to breathe deeply to laugh um, the things you're thinking about the pain like we talked about but this is safe not dangerous other stressors you There's might have some, in your life also some evidence that uh, true mirthful laughter or joyful laughter I'm seeing uh, dr. Lee Burke in some recent studies that he's reporting about uh, laughter is using the term joyful laughter. So there, he's being specific about uh, it's not just, it's, it's, it's not a fake laugh. It's not a contrived kind of a thing. Um, somebody said, you know, if the boss tells a joke at work, and even if it's a terrible joke, we're all going to laugh. But that's not real laughter. That's like, ha ha, boss, you're very funny. Um, but if we're truly amused, uh, that's when we really begin to change our, our physiology and, and get the benefits. Um, so joyful laughter, true mirthful, you know, amusement. And, and one of the things that's so important about this, I think, and, and the fact that we're even introducing the topic here, is so many people have been led to believe that um, to grow up, you have to grim up. You know, if you're going to be really adult, if you're going to be really mature, you got to stop the funny stuff, stop the giggling, stop the, and that's that's not right at all. There is a there's a way that you can be mature and engage in some nonsense and silliness, and it will make sense, and it will be a smart thing to do. So we're change, trying to help people change their minds about the importance of humor and laughter. Yeah, I I really I, encourage my patients to find that inner child in them because. We're hardwired to laugh. I mean, it's thought we've been laughing 16 million years. It's, it's um, people laugh the same all over the world. And I'm talking about the physical act of laughter, not, not humor, because that's very individual. But um, he, there's a reason that this has survived so long. And that, like you said, we're, we're taught, act like an adult, be serious. No, we need to find that inner child in us because there's a, a very strong purpose to this laughter and and just being silly and finding the, the fun and things because um, that's going to access that thing Absolutely. that you're hard Absolutely. to do. Uh, can we, uh, for those of us who are looking at this on the screen, you can see perhaps that uh, Rich uh, has asked a question about uh, is there a report, a paper that reviews the physiology uh, of laughter? Mary, you, you have put in a reference. Um, yeah. And if if people can't see it or or it doesn't come up in this uh, conversation we're having now, uh, we are available and uh, 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 DPC is available uh, to follow up. And um, it just depends on how deep you want to go in the kind of evidence you're looking for. There's all kinds of right. levels of evidence. And follow up with us by, you know, email. Or, um, and we'll, we'll help you out with that. Absolutely. Um, so, the, I mean, the bottom line is because there are all these different things you can do and you can attack chronic pain from multiple angles. That's the hope. I mean, because when you think about being told, oh, well, you're going to have the pain for the rest of your life, that doesn't message doesn't carry much hope. But the hope is, okay. well, yeah, you're going to have this condition, but, but we've got some ways to help you negotiate your life where it doesn't take over your life. I can't imagine who would tell a patient you're going to have this pain for the rest of your life. <laughs> I, I think about, there's an old joke uh, about uh, uh, 
uh, doctor gives the patient six months to live and he doesn't pay his bill, so he gives him another six months. Uh, <laughs> you know, pronouncing uh, the, the sentence, that, 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 to me, that's awful. Uh, yeah. Nobody, uh, for sure. Uh, so uh, I don't like those uh, kinds of uh, uh, we're sentencing you to pain. And you're going to have no, it. You know, exactly. for tomorrow. There may be a discovery. There may be something that we find, and there have been over the years. Uh, you know, remedies, uh, ways to reduce pain. Um, so, I don't want anyone to think that you know anyone knows how long they're going to have it. And it, and the hope is there that researchers uh, will come up with something. And, and uh, that, the, you know, you can find relief in many different ways. The, pa the words that, that providers use, if there's any providers on the call, are, are so important. You know, you, you need to think about what you're saying. And, um, you know, even the placebo studies that were done many years ago found that, okay, if the person went in and said this shot's going to work, even if it was sugar, you know, saline, um, if the person was wearing a white coat and looked really reputable and, and talked about how effective it was going to be, it worked more. So as providers, we need to talk about, and I'm not saying lie, but I'm just saying, you know, use the positive side because that brain is going to interpret whether it's safer or dangerous. And so the messages you're giving makes a big difference. You know, I heard the story about the fellow who um, went into a room. He was with a group of people. He went into the, another room, and, and uh, he fainted, and he made a lot of noise, and people went in to see what happened. And uh, he, he, they, he, they roused him out of the faint, and he said it was a snake. It was a snake, and they saw that because he was deathly afraid of snakes. But there was no snake. He was laying there on the floor next to a coil of rope. But he <laughs> thought it was a snake. And the thought uh -huh. sent him into a faint. Uh, so we have to watch what we think and, tr and be accurate and do our best to maintain hope. And, and I will say that, you know, the physiology of laughter that shows that uh, uh, you know, if you have a, a joyful laugh, a mirthful laugh, really amused, uh, there's evidence that the body produces chemicals that are its own painkillers. Um, and uh, and I think it's important to let everybody know that that is helpful uh, and might bring you some relief when pain is mild, when it's at a low level, maybe towards moderate. But it, it's not, I mean, it's not going to work real. So you have real intense pain. Somebody says, you know, well, get a joke or laugh it off. That's the wrong prescription. Yeah. You know, it may work, yeah. may work better when things are low level and mild. Uh, the humor, the laughter, the distraction of it. Um, somebody said a person without a sense of humor is like a wagon without springs, jolted by every pebble in the road. So humor is a shock absorber. <laughs> Laughter, it, it, you know, but you, you, yeah, and you need it along the trip, but it's not active constantly. You know, there for moments when you need it, and it can help. But if you come to, I mean, we're seeing here uh, major potholes on the highways now. The winter is over, but it's left a lot of damage. <laughs> if you go over a, you go over a little pothole, the shock absorbers in your car are going to take care of that. And that's sort of like equivalent to humor and laughter taking up some of the pain. But if you if you can go into a deep pothole, people are complaining, oh, I broke the spring, broke my axle, major damage. Uh, you know, the shock absorber uh, is only good for certain kinds of shocks. So it's a good idea to prepare yourself to develop these attitudes to uh, Take, have an attitude towards laughter and humor as um, these could be helpful. Not right. these will always be helpful, but they could be. So, And, uh, and I do tell you know, my patients that 
this is the tool to add to their toolbox that that yeah this is going to help with the shock absorbers on on but but you you have other tools too so you add them all together and that's going to help their pain great idea you don't just want to have a toolbox with a hammer you need to yes, have lots exactly. of different uh, things that, that you'll deal with so we're looking at the slide that uh, with Groucho Marx. Yeah, I mean, he came, I mean, he said this way before all the research about the benefits of laughter and humor, but he said, a clown is like an aspirin, only he works twice as fast. Um, and then another quote that I love is um, Milton Burrow, who said, laughter is an instant vacation. And because it can, short circuit if you're feeling down or depressed it can short circuit that pathway in your brain even if it's only for 30 seconds um, it can just kind of take you away and um, and help relieve some have, of that anxiety you know I, I uh, produced a book um, called eat dessert first that was from <laughs> Mark Twain who, who said Life is uncertain, so eat your dessert first. I think that's, I love that philosophy. It's the opposite of saving the best for last. Yes. Um, yes. It's always saving the best for last. You know, in life, what if you don't get there? You don't even get to So I'm telling people, eat dessert first. Get get some of the good stuff uh, now while you can. Um, and it. Uh, uh, you know, having those, developing those kinds of attitudes to embrace humor and laughter, to endorse it, to give it a try. It may not yeah. work every time as good as you might want it to, but what Groucho Marx and Milton Berle, and as I put together my book, Eat Dessert First, is several hundred quotations that I researched about humor and laughter and play, and, and it goes back to ancient times. Uh -huh. what, what these people were trying to say is that humor and laughter are a good thing. It's not <laughs> just, you know, it's not juvenile. It's not trivial. It, it, it's important. And they were trying to shift attitudes even before the science was there. But now some of the things that they, that we quote them as saying, we're now the evidence is coming in. Right. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah. And then another and, uh, quote that I really love with my patient that I emphasize with my patients is uh, laughter is the shortest distance between two people um, from Victor Borgia. And, um, you know, living with any kind of chronic condition, I know that there's probably a lot of people li listening that have chronic kidney disease, that it can be socially isolating. You know, a lot of your time is spent going to appointments or you you don't have the energy to go out and do things, but uh, laughter and humor are such wonderful tools to help build those social relationships. Um, it's it's something that should never really be dis discounted because it's a really important purpose for laughter and humor. Yeah, you know, Mary, I'm an old hippie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. You know. <laughs> that means I only I only remember some of the '60s, um, uh -oh. but the but, but you know it, in the in the uh, in the '60s and '70s and and when that sort of tremendous social upheaval was going on with drugs, sexual revolution, um, a war in Vietnam, all kinds of things, uh, uh, we were uh, we we used to talk about vibes. People give off vibes. Uh, vibrations. So I'd like everyone to sort of consider that possibility that that could be correct. Uh, just give it some consideration. Sometimes you go into a, a place, could be a store, could be somebody's home or whatever, and immediately you feel good. You says something about the place. And we would say, I like the vibes here. These, I'm getting good vibes. Uh, or there's a person that you meet. Uh, and you may not have ever met them before, but there's just something about them, and it's positive and it's appealing. And on the other hand, there are bad vibes. You go up, can go into a place or meet a person, and you say, "Ooh, 
I don't like the vibes here. I don't like so when we say laughter connects people and is the shortest distance, we're talking about the positive vibes. Uh, the uh, uh, Beverly Sills, famous uh, uh, um, opera star, said, I can't be happy every day, but I can be cheerful. Yeah. And I thought that was, what an interesting idea. There are people that you run into. You're on the elevator with them. You see them in the parking lot. You spend 30 seconds, spend a minute with them. There are some people you're so happy to see. You know, every time I see her, I feel good. Every time I run into her, um, I feel And then there's the other side. The people who, if you see them coming, you want to run the other way. They're so <laughs> full of doom and gloom. They're negative. And so I'm asking everybody on this call and everyone who hears this recording to think about what are people saying after they have run into you, after they've spent a minute or two with you. When you part company, are people saying, I'm so glad I saw him today. I'm so glad I ran into her. Or are they saying, oh, my gosh. I wish I had never run into them. Think about what vibes or vibrations, what, what are you projecting, and make a decision that you want to be an uplifter. Let's be positive with each other. Let's be pleasant. Let's be cheerful. That's so attractive. Uh, and we can, I think it's a decision that we can make. Uh, whenever uh, the energy is there, and I know the time is right, and I think of it, I'm going to be a cheerful person. I go in for the dialysis. I don't personally, but I'm just saying you might say that. I would go in for treatment. I go to the doctor's office. I'm going to be cheerful. I'm going to try to spread cheer and hope that other people will pick up on that, and then they'll spread it back to me. So, you know, next thing you know, the world is a more cheerful place. Yeah. I sound like I was a shocking statement. I lost, I lost control <laughs> of my, um, I lost control of my, my pointer. So here we go, and that goes right into your <laughs> and your whole thing of joyology. Thank you. <laughs> I love the technology. We're learning how to work with folks. Thanks for being patient with us. Mary lost the electronic pointer. Okay, so that you can see on the screen a very important word that encompasses my work of the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, and I, I call it joyology. Um, and at the bottom of this slide is a definition, a brief description of joyology. It is a lifestyle that skillfully blends laughter, humor, and attitude that can help recover from difficulty and reawaken the joy of being alive. So. The point here is that a good day, uh, a good life, joy, uh, pleasure, amusement, those are not a matter of luck. Those are, you, if you see somebody who seems to be having a good life and you feel like things are going good for you, that it, we don't want that to be a fluke. That's not an accident. Uh, that, there are things that we know. Mary, as a, as a nurse in, in very uh, important practice that she's doing with her patients, I'm a psychologist, lots of other people uh, say we know uh, that there are things that you can learn. And I use the word skillfully about joyology as a lifestyle that, that incorporates certain things about laughter and humor. It's not about comedy. It's not about how to tell a joke. Not about how to be funny, like you said earlier, uh, Mary. It, it has to do with being willing to see what's funny, to see that there's something maybe even absurd. Maybe things get so bad that you, that you end up laughing about them. Um, there's something funny going on here, and, and that's a skill, to perceive that uh, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, then it affects you emotionally. So three things. Um, go into joyology. Um, laughter is so important, and uh, it's a, but it's 
And it's necessary. A good life, a joyful life is going to have the right kind of positive laughter, mirthful, joyful laughter. But that's not enough. Laughter alone is not enough. It's going to have humor. You're going to develop your sense of humor. You're going to find more opportunities to be amused and enjoy life. And and uh, you're going to be uh, spending time being sure that um, you watch a comedy on television or if you're going to the movies, pick out something that's funny. Um, to watch now with YouTube and, and so much information available. If you've got a favorite comedian, chances are you like uh, um Jim Gaffigan, I'm just pulled that out of there, or whoever you like, uh, the chances are you can find their a concert. You can find them doing their thing and amusing everybody at YouTube, right on on your computer if you're doing that. So, joyology has three things going on for it. You need humor in your life, the right kind of humor, positive humor, not the, not about telling jokes. Uh, we, we know it looks like only 2 to 5% of people can remember a joke and tell it well. And my advice to everybody is if you can't remember a joke, don't dismember it. Uh, don't worry <laughs> about telling jokes. Uh, and we, we've, uh, well, we'll talk about that over and over again, and we've done it in some of the other webinars on this topic. Um, we, but it's okay maybe you – Find a couple of uh, cartoons or jokes on uh, the Internet the day that you're going in for treatment uh, or you have a doctor's appointment and print them out. I, I'm taking jokes to my uh, treatment uh, staff, my team, all the time. They've got a tough job. They need to lighten up. I need to lighten up. They need to know I'm a cooperative patient. I'm on their side. Let's be cheerful with each other. I make that happen. In fact, I, one of my uh, doctors, an endocrinologist who I was seeing, uh, um, he retired, and he said, you know, I really hate to retire because I'm going to miss your jokes. Uh, so we were, it was uplifting, and we can do that for each other. It doesn't cure illness, but it makes you know, people with serious illness have told us that humor makes the unbearable a little more bearable. It's it's not a major cure, but it can shift things. And, and we're joined by other positive. Yeah. Yes, we're joined by other positive people. Um, should I should I flip the slide here? Do you think? Oh, sure. Uh, or do you want to? <laughs> okay, let's look at the next next. You got it. Um, so uh, these are the authors I talked about earlier that did the explain pain. Where he, they say, uh, what is the complete opposite of a stress response? A hearty laugh in a safe place with friends. So they're really talking about kind of summarizing some of the topics we've mentioned. The social aspect, lowering the stress response. Um, it's just, I thought it was a, a good summary. We asked them when we train um, people in the in laughter therapy, and it, my curriculum uh, that I've been doing with World Laughter Tour, that's the name of the organization that does the teaching, we uh, over 7,000 people have taken the course, doctors, nurses, teachers, parents, people from every walk of life, chaplains, clowns, just ordinary people who just want a little more cheer in their life. 7,000 people have learned about laughter therapy. And one of the things that we emphasize is we want to be laughing with people, not at them. That's what makes yeah. it safe. I love this slide for the concept of a safe place. If we're going to have humor, if you're going to bring jokes in uh, or some kind of humor into uh, wherever you're going, you've got to ask yourself, um, is the language uh, going to be acceptable? Is it going to invite people to enjoy this uh, humor or is it going to turn them off because they don't like the language? And be selective in the kind of humor you bring because of thinking of who you're bringing it to. And that's that's a skill, understanding that, knowing that. Um, a, a hearty laugh in a safe place with friends. Terrific. It's a very positive description of therapeutic laughter. 
yeah. not all the details. No. <laughs> I, I, you know, somebody said, uh, how do you make money in business? And, and the fellow answered, he said, well, you buy some stuff and you sell it for more than you paid for. <laughs> yeah. That and a few million details and you'll be successful. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's a, that's what we're saying on this slide, a hearty laugh and a safe place with friends. That's great. And there's a few million details. There's, a, there's, there's some details so that you can yeah. really hone the skills and sharpen them. Let's go. Let's look at the next slide. Can you do that? So that's just there, there, there's me and, and two two of my personas. Sometimes I wear a hat, and it's a and it's a funny kind of a clownish hat um, in a certain kind of a mood. Sometimes I don't wear a hat. How many hats do you wear? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the first thing that made a very big difference in my contentment with life was after struggling with am I a psychologist or am I a teacher or am I a humorist? And then I realized, no, first thing I am is a human being. And I just wear different hats at different times. Uh, and that, uh, that freed me up to say I'm a human and I, and I have certain needs and my work has been about what I call illuminating the human condition. Um, and, uh, uh, that made a, that made a big difference. And you can, you know, some, sometimes I'm a teacher, sometimes I'm a psychologist, sometimes I'm foolish, sometimes I'm serious, sometimes I'm grieving and grim. I mean, you know, that's all part of being human. Let's flip to the next slide and we'll talk about this uh, program that's the values and attitudes. Remember, joyology is an integration of humor, laughter, and certain values. Now here our values and attitudes that we teach. I think these are important. I created this uh, called Good-Hearted Living. You will find this at worldlaughtertour.com. That's the website. Um, it's got a lot of great information for you, and you will find uh, a summary of Good-Hearted Living and what it means. Uh, and by the way, I've had it translated into dozens of languages. So if you know somebody who's more comfortable with Spanish or Korean or Swahili or Japanese or French or German or Greek. I mean, all these languages, the, these principles of good-hearted living. We start very, it's a very gentle process, easy to get started with. Um, so you don't have to do it all at once and master it all at once. Mondays, you pay compliments. And we just try to do three on Monday. If you're getting started on the path of good-hearted living, Tuesdays, can you find three times when you're going to be flexible, when you're going to go with the flow, when you're not going to uh, be uh, uh, thrown off balance by uh, something that was, a, there was a setback or disappointment. No, you're going to be flexible. Um, you yeah, say I, that and I, the Steve, Steve, I tell, I tell my oh. patients, just try to do something different on a Tuesday. Um, because life sometimes makes things makes you do different things. So if you practice at it, then you get used to it. Um, so it could be eating breakfast, food, yeah. dinner, or brushing your teeth with your opposite hand. Just mix it up. Just learn to, to go with the flow, with whatever's going on. Uh, that's great. Um, the uh, Wednesdays are for gratitude. Again, we start, just pick a day and do one practice. What happens, Thursdays for kindness, Fridays for forgiveness, weekends are for chocolate. These are explained in a very clear way um, when you get to the worldlaughtertour.com website, download a one-page explanation of this in all these different languages. Um, and what you find from doing this is because it's a practice, and then you try it out. And then you see the result, which is almost always positive, and it makes you feel like, I would like to do more of this. I like this reaction I'm getting from people. And then after a few weeks, it doesn't take very long, and you find that you're paying compliments on Wednesday or, or <laughs> Friday. When we say weekends are for chocolate, that means do, do, do sweet things. And it's so important that you do things that are sweet to you not literally chocolate necessarily, although in my case it might be. But we, it's so important that I said, let's have two days for sweet things. The others were going to assign one day to practice. 
Um, and then next thing you know, it becomes integrated into your lifestyle, and you're acting and doing these things on any particular day, many of them, several of them on any day, and life gets easier. You're, you're getting along better with other people. You're bouncing back quicker from difficulty, um, and you're feeling, you know, a pretty good thing. I'm alive. I made it another day. There's another slide very uh, quickly that will be here. We don't have time to yeah. get into it in a lot of – whoop, detail. Wait, back up. I'm backing up. I <laughs> People controlling. Here we go. Uh, you yeah, do it. Just, you do it. Okay. There we go. How to add, <laughs> la how to add laughter to your life. Uh, Mary, uh, we, we've got a half a dozen things here, uh, suggestions. Uh, this is also a question you can ask Siri. This is also a, something you can Google. Uh, I, I did, was on this morning just to check it out. There's a tremendous amount of information. Uh, if you've got a smartphone, um, I heard the other day, if you've got a smartphone in your hand, you have more technology available to you than was available to the uh, first moon landing. Uh, wow. We've come a long way. Uh, so he, we've got some suggestions, but there's more, um, and you can reach us after this. Uh, Any time you listen to this discussion that we, Mary and I, have had today, uh, reach out to us. We will help you any way we can with adding more laughter to your life, using humor in a positive way that lifts people up, doesn't put them down. Uh, I don't see. I'm looking on the chat box. I don't see any other. Questions? Did, did some other questions come in, or maybe I didn't. I want to check real quick. Be great if I could find my cursor. Oh, there it is. Who okay. wants to ask a question? We have three minutes. <laughs> well, that's fine. You want to unmute, uh, or is there a way to know who wants to ask a question? We'll get one in quick. So I and always I'm... follow up. Follow up with yeah, us afterwards with your questions. We'll answer them. Stephen, Mary, thank you so much for all of your information. Um, if you would like to ask a question live, please unmute your phone by hitting pound six. And there is one um, question in the chat box if you have resources for more laughter ideas. I, I'm going to assume that we will be able to send them um, a link to some resources um, when we send them the slides. Is that correct? If you will go, yes, you're going to get, uh, just go to worldlaughtertour.com, look in the shop. Um, there's free shipping on everything that's in there, but lots of books. There's a book, I don't, I'll leave some out, but one is called Laugh Your Lips Off. Great advice, great fun. If, so, if you're under the weather or you know somebody else who's, who's feeling down, great to give them a book of lighthearted uh, material that can be read quickly. Um, they can spend a few minutes on it at a time. Uh, and it, there's a lot of material. And, and if you don't find what you're looking for, contact me personally. I will Thanks. help you. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, we are just about out of time. I, again, want to thank both of you um, for all of the enlightenment today. Um, please, if you will, complete the feedback form. And when you finish the, when you complete the form, if you want to let us know ways that you add laughter to your life, we'll also be able to post that on our, we can do a general form and uh, post that information on our website. I also encourage you to join us on May 23rd for our next webinar. It will be on psychosocial factors affecting children and families living with chronic illness. And as we conclude today, I hope everybody puts a smile on their faces and, and go out and share joy, laughter, and good-hearted living with others. Again, Steve and Mary, thank you so much. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank, thank you, you Kathy. We'll see you all next time. Thanks, Mary. Yay! Good job. Yay. <laughs>